With so much violence and hate in the world, God, why don't you just stop it? Don't you even see all the pain and crap happening in the world? Even in the church. You say you love us, but why do you let bad things happen to good people? Why are kids molested? Aren't you watching what's going on? This one's entitled, Church Happens. <laughs> we've been looking at a different aspect of the crustiness of life uh, as we've gone through a series. And uh, so this is uh, Church Happens. Because some of you may have noticed, once in a while, there are a few churches out there, this perhaps being one of them, that are not perfect. Uh, and sometimes you take crap. So we're going to be looking at this. I want to start with a... Uh, oh, and as, as we're going uh, through this message, be thinking of questions to have. Uh, as we've done throughout this series, and we're going to try to continue this as much as possible uh, in future messages, at least some of the time. Um, uh, we'll, we'll take questions at the end of uh, the message. So text in your questions, um, or if you don't have uh, the means of texting, you can go to the back of the auditorium and write them out on a piece of paper, put them in an envelope, and uh, get your questions in that way. Hey, uh, you Trevor fans, uh, didn't he look cute up there on the stage? Trevor, you got, he got married! Oh, this is first service as a married person. Oh, that's wonderful. Great wedding, great time, great party. All right. And then that has nothing to do with crap happens, by the way. I just associate those two things, just to make sure. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul's talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And he says, uh, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit. All these gifts come to us, the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one as he determines. Everyone's given a gift. We all have a role to play. And just as the body, though it's one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So our bodies are formed with many parts, but it's one body. And it is functional to the degree that all the parts are sort of integrated. My fingers do it, my head say, and my arms, and they're connected to my torso and my legs, and so on and so on. That's how the body of Christ is. And we are to be a people who uh, manifest... The will of God on earth as it is in heaven. We're the body of Christ. We're to be his arms, his hands, his eyes, his feet, the whole shebang. So the question that we're dealing with here this morning is, if we're to be the body of Christ here on earth and reflect his character and love and will, why is it so often the case that we don't? In fact, why is it so often the case that the church manifests the opposite of that? Uh, what's really ironic is that the uh, body of Christ was to be the proof that Jesus Christ is for real. In John 17, you, you read this, where it says, Praise Father, let them be one, as we are one. Let, let their love mirror the love of the triune God. And uh, in doing that, the world will come to know that I am for real, that you've sent me. So the church is to be the proof that Jesus Christ is for real. But honestly, and we're going to really try to be honest in this message, sometimes it seems like it's rather an argument that Jesus is not real. I do debates here and there with, uh, in universities sometimes with atheists and skeptics and, and uh, different scholars. And they offer a lot of objections to the truthfulness of, 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 of Christianity, uh, arguing that Jesus is a legend, arguing that uh, the Bible is not true, or whatever. But I believe the strongest argument against the truthfulness of Christianity, which I believe is true, by the way, in case you're wondering, but the best argument you can raise against it is the church. If, if this is real, then why do Christians so often do horrendous things? My dad and I got into a conversation uh, back in 1988. Uh, it was a letter correspondence. I wrote him, uh, and I just asked the question, you know, really just saying, Dad, look, I know that you're puzzled by the fact that I'm still a Christian. You thought it would be a phase I was going through. You, thought, you think all Christians are idiots. Uh, and um, so you're wondering, I know you are, why I am still a Christian. Let me tell you why, and I want to give you a chance to ask me all the, or, or, or share with me all the reasons why you're not. Let's just have a discussion here. And he wrote back in 1988. It's now a book called Letters from a Skeptic. Uh, There's three years of, of correspondence. But he wrote back and basically said, I'm retired now. I got a lot of time on my hands. You want to fight? Let's fight. Uh, <laughs> let's have a little debate. And so he, he, he kind of volleyed up the first question. And his first question was, was the best. If Christianity is true, why has the church done so much harm throughout history? Why, why has Christianity done so much harm? Yeah, it's done some good too, for sure, but all religions do that. 
The question is, my dad said, is if Christianity is true, if the church is sort of the bearer of truth and righteousness, wouldn't they stand out a little bit in terms of uh, you know, compares, comparing with other groups? Wouldn't they be sort of distinctive in how they love and how they're kind? But as a matter of fact, as my dad eloquently pointed out throughout history, they've often done horrendous things, nightmares things, demonic things. Actually, for the first three centuries, the church was relatively good. It wasn't perfect. It's never been perfect because it has people, and people aren't perfect. But for the first three centuries, the church was known for its generosity, its kindness, its self-sacrificial love. Rodney Stark, in his book, The Rise of Christianity, he's, he's, he's not a Christian. He's a secular historian. But he argues that the reason why the church grew so fast those first 300 years, despite the fact that it was persecuted, was because Christians were just outrageously loving. When a plague would hit a town and everyone would flee, that's what you did in the ancient world, including doctors, everyone would just run for their life. And they'd leave behind all the sick who were already afflicted with the plague. Christians very frequently would stay behind and care for the sick, often giving their own life in the process. But see, that was a testimony. That bore witness. That was the proof that the message they had, at least was one of the proofs that the message they had was real. And so the church grew by leaps and bounds, despite the fact that it was illegal to be a Christian. Christians were known as, as, as folks who would hang out uh, by the bridges at night and capture kids who were thrown over because it was legal in the ancient Roman world for a father to choose to abandon their child up to two weeks uh, after they were born, and they would throw them over bridges into the water. They thought the child was defective or just didn't want the child. It was a father's right. And actually, Christians were known as undermining family values and parental authority because they'd go and rescue those kids. Undermining family values. <laughs> Fathers knows best. Yeah. So they, they, but th that their willingness to sacrifice for these kids who weren't wanted was a testimony to others uh, that, that Jesus was real. The way that they died. I mean, when they would get killed, typically, I mean, usually what was entertaining in the ancient world is all the people would come to the Colosseums, they'd light up the lions and the gladiators and kill whoever needed to be killed. That was kind of the entertainment back then. And Christians, what was distinctive was that when they were being killed, when the lions were let out on them, they'd be praying for people. They'd be blessing the crowds. And they weren't much fun, really. It's not fun to watch someone get eaten by a lion when they're praying for you. You want them to be cursing and railing at you and all that stuff. Uh, but that bore witness to some people who were open to it. They said, man, there's something up with these Christians. They're, they're, they, 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 they love us even when they're being eaten alive. They pray for us. Uh, they, they stay behind for sick people. For the first three centuries, things were pretty good. And then the worst possible thing happened to the church. It is, I think, the worst thing that could happen to the church. And it's the thing that many Christians are trying to make happen again. And that is that the church was given power. <laughs> it's terrible. The church was given power, political power, state power, military power. In the 4th century, Constantine supposedly became a Christian and all of a sudden began to give the church all this authority. Now, Jesus, back in the Gospels, he, when, when Satan offered him all this authority, he said, get behind me, Satan. He didn't want any of it. Now, in the 4th century, Christians were kind of tired of being persecuted all the time, so folks like Eusebius and St. Augustine said, oh, look at God's given us all this authority. Now we can rule the world. Wow, and, 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 and why not? Because we are the righteous and we are the wise. Who better to rule people than us? And, and we always thought we were going to have to advance the cause of the gospel by dying for it and sacrificing. Turns out that was just a little temporary thing to get it going. Now we can, now we can make converts by carrying the sword. Yippee! And, and we're going to conquer the world for, in Jesus' name. And St. Augustine, oh, he bothers me sometimes. I, a bright guy, had, had some good things to say. I'm not, but, but some of his stuff was just so irritating. And, and so he finds this verse in the gospels, compel them to come in. Jesus says, go out and compel them to come in. And St. Augustine goes, compel, ah, we have swords, we can compel. And so they go out and they start evangelizing, using coercion to get people into the kingdom, using coercion and even violence and even killing to squash heresies and to control. And then you set in motion a history of bloodshed that is just, that is what my dad's talking about. Now there's always been a strand of, of folks, they've almost always been the minority, but a strand of folks who lived like Jesus, loved like Jesus, served like Jesus, sacrificed like Jesus, loved their enemies, swore off violence. There's always been a strand. But unfortunately, after Augustine, the institutional church, on the whole, did some rather nasty things. Yes, they did a lot of good, too. I don't mean to minimize that. But now, well, actually, it was pretty typical for what nations do and what religions do and what states do. 
I, you know, they do some good and they do some evil. It's just that this evil was done in Jesus' name, which makes it super evil. Uh, it makes it super demonic. So and the, the irony is this. In the name of the one who taught us to turn the other cheek, the church starts cutting off people's heads. Throughout the Middle Ages, that's what they did. In the name of the one who taught us to spread the fire of God's love, we just started setting people on fire. In the name of the one who taught us to, to feed the hungry, we would starve out cities if we thought that they were heretical or our enemies. In the name of the one who taught us to love our enemies, we start killing our enemies, we start torturing our enemies. And now the, 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 the people who were supposed to be the greatest proof that Christianity is true became the greatest reason to think that it's not. What's wrong with this picture? Uh, it was a diabolical irony. And to some degree, this goes on to this day. Now, we, we aren't torturing people anymore, thank God, and, and, and we're not trying to rule the world, although some people still want to try to get that power, and they think that if we, if we just get enough power, we'll be able to conquer in Jesus' name and whatever. Uh, you still have that mindset around, but there's still scandals all over the place. The church still does, does it not? Let's be honest here. Let's, some crappy things, some crappy things. And you get, get it a lot on the news, you know, the scandals that are going on, church covering up pedophiles or relocating them and, and, uh, and all these sexual scandals that go on. It's, it's a steady stream of stuff. And you hear about other kind of craziness and insanity, like the guy burning the crayon down in Florida or this Westboro cult that, 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 that mocks the funerals of soldiers because they, they think that it's their job to express God's wrath towards gay people. And what that has to do with mocking the death of a soldier, no one but them understands. And I don't think even they understand, but that's what they're doing. And it's just ugly. It's ugly. And, and the other things, you know, probably one of the most harmful things is when you got public spokesperson, spokespeople who, who uh, uh, are out there, and they're well-intentioned. I bless them. I, they mean well. But they fuse their faith with all sorts of other stuff. And now they're running, maybe they don't say it exactly like this, but everyone kind of knows they're running on the Jesus ticket, and they're appealing to, to, to the Christians. And now they, they mix up all of their faith and their agendas with Jesus stuff. And these are the folks that are going to take America back for God, back to the good old days when everyone who came here was supposedly treated equally. And, and, and we're just going to take it back to the, the one nation under God sort of thing. And maybe you agree with their politics, maybe you don't. I could care less, but what happens is when you mix Jesus up with all that stuff, then all the folks who disagree with those, that, that politics now have a reason to disagree with Jesus. And they think that the two are the same. And so this insanity can, can, still goes on. And there's still this, this, a religious spirit that is hateful that permeates stuff. The way Christians talk about one another sometimes, let alone towards other folks, when they're judging them for their sins because we don't ever judge our own sins, there's a spirit that can just be so anti-Christ. It's illegal now to kill in Jesus' name and to torture in Jesus' name. Though even that, sadly, was no thanks to the church. It was secular authorities in the 17th century who got together and said, hey, we've got to stop these Christians from killing one another. It's hurting our economy. I'm not kidding. Uh, and, and so they passed the Peace of Westphalia, which is really where uh, now tolerance became a supreme virtue in Western culture. Because we had 100 years of Christians killing one another off. Not exactly the proof that Jesus was looking for. You see, and so now, now it's illegal. And I'm thankful for that because otherwise I think I'd be dead. <laughs> but I, I honestly, I'm, I'm not kidding. I have talked to people uh, who I believe in the core of my being would, would set me on fire if they could. Uh, you can see in their eyes. I even said this once to a guy. I was at an academic uh, conference. And he came up and his voice was quivering because he was defending the glory of God against me. Uh, and, and, and Mr. Boyd, I'm just rooting, and he's just talking with this, and, and, and his, oh, his eyes. I never got how, how you could ever set someone on fire in Jesus' name until I see those eyes. It's like, whoa, whoa. And I said to him, I go, you'd kill me right now if you could, wouldn't you? I, I get it. I, 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 coin dropped in a slot. You would kill me. Thankfully, there's a law that says you can't, nah, 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 nah. but you would if you could. And so... It's terrible stuff has happened, and it's not just a theoretical kind of thing. I mean, there's a book out there called Unchristian, and it does this sort of a survey of what non-Christians think of Christians, especially conservative Christians, and it ain't pretty. I'd almost encourage you to read the book, but I want to discourage you if you're at all prone towards de toward depression, because this will make you more depressed. Um, it, it's, a, it's just an expose, and, and basically it, what, what it shows is that most people in the West have a positive view of Jesus, but a very negative view of Christians, especially conservative Christians. And they see them as anti-gay and anti-women and anti-progress. They see them as pro-life, but oddly that gets mixed in with being more pro-gun than the rest of the culture, more pro-military than the rest of the culture, 
And this two months ago, they, this, they came up with this. More pro-torture than the rest of the culture. Uh, there's a correlation between how favorably you view torture uh, and, and, and how, how intensely you take your, your Christian faith. What's wrong with this picture? And so there's a, it's a real kind of a mixed bag sort of thing. But the bottom line is it's not positive. And some of us, it's not just about statistics, but you've been the losing end of religion. The church has, has dumped on you. You're coming here. Maybe you're listening to this whether you're in this auditorium or listening through some other means, and, and you, you, you have the scars, maybe even the fresh wounds of a church that has abused you or you've been dumped on in some other ways. There's been folks who have come to Willow Hills Church that came from a church where the pastor was sleeping, it turned out later on, with 14 people in his congregation at the same time. And, and ish is right, ish. And uh, two of them were the mother and daughter. And, 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 and no one knew that the others were, were sleeping with the pastor. And finally, it was all blown up. That's kind of nasty. That's, that's, Jesus wouldn't do that. Uh, that's not the proof Jesus is looking for. There's folks who come, and, and you were in churches that were hyper-controlling, where the pastor had to give his approval for everything, including what you're going to name your kids. Uh, there's, there's, some of you come from churches where if you're a woman, you're not allowed to have any say in anything. You can't vote. You can't teach. You can't do anything like that. You can give an offering. They will let you do that. Otherwise, <laughs> there, there's not much of a, a, a spot for you. Uh, there's churches where people have been ostracized because they dared to disagree with the pastor, or in one case I know about his wife, and boom, that, 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 that brought the disdain of the whole church, and they were kicked out. Abuse happens. Sexual abuse, other sorts of things. Crap happens, and part of that crap is the church. So the question we've been asking throughout this series is, how do we respond to that? What do we do in the light of that? How do we make sense out of that? I want to say four things here very quickly, and then we're going to take some questions. So if questions arise, text those in. The number is 651-blah-blah-blah-3030. 651-blah-3030. There you go. Six five one. That's 651 3030 Call now. Supplies are limited. Visa and MasterCard accepted. You know, we ought to do that. That's a good offering idea. We just credit card. I, I, I've heard they do that. They have like a credit card swipe machine. Oh, never mind. Okay. So number one, remember, always important, so important, vitally important to remember that Jesus didn't come. Jesus did not come to start a religion. We don't need another religion. He didn't come to start a religion. In fact, I've argued in a book out there called Repenting of Religion that religion, far from being the expression of God's will on earth, is a major obstacle to God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus didn't come to start a religion. Jesus came to start a movement, an organic, spirit-inspired movement, and he calls that movement the reign of God, the kingdom of God. And you can always tell where that movement is, 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 is being birthed and where it's growing. Because it always looks like Jesus. This will clarify things so, so, so much if you lock this in. The kingdom that Jesus is about, and it's the only thing that he's about, it always looks like him. Not perfectly, of course, because it involves human beings. And so it's always a more or less sort of thing. But it always has people who are moving in this direction, where they're learning how to love like Jesus and serve like Jesus Come under people like Jesus. Get, you, you serve on your knees. It's free of arrogance. Uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it obeys the teachings of Jesus where you notice the two by four in your own eye before you start looking for specks in other people's eyes. Most importantly, it's a, it's a movement that swears off violence and loves your enemies and you bless those who persecute you and you do good to those who despitefully use you because that's what Jesus did and that's what Jesus taught. Wherever you have people who name the name of Christ and they're moving in that direction, to that degree, the kingdom of God, the reign of God is present. There's no mystery here. You don't have to ask a lot of theological questions. You just look. In fact, I would suggest to you that asking, asking people what they believe or what they call themselves is pretty irrelevant. It will only confuse things. Look at the life. John says in 1 John 2, 6, that whoever claims to abide in him must live as he lived. So if you have folks who are living as he lived, to that degree, the kingdom is present. That's the only thing Jesus is about. To the degree that you have folks who aren't loving their enemies, who aren't serving the poor, caring about the outcasts, entering into solidarity with others who are oppressed, aren't, aren't living with outrageous generosity, to the degree that you just sort of have a religious thing going on with all sorts of their pomp and circumstance and engaging in violence and not loving their enemies but retaliating and just slapping the label Christian out of the violence that they want to do, that's not the kingdom of God. It's got nothing to do with the kingdom of God. It may call itself Christian. It may, 
you know, call some denomination or what have you, but see, it's got nothing to do with the kingdom of God. I used to try to defend the church. When, when, when critics would, you know, say, oh, these Christians do nasty stuff, the church. And I would like, oh, yeah, well, it's imperfect, but by golly, we do a lot of good things and, 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 and you know, kind of enter into that. Same thing with church history. I used to, like, have this defensiveness, like, okay, yeah, there's some evil there, but, but they did a lot of good and, and, and kind of play that game. I used to get embarrassed when, when, when Christian spokespeople would talk on television and say stuff uh, that's just... Makes me want to become a Buddhist. <laughs> and I used to like, but that's because I thought, I thought that that was the tribe I had to identify with. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But see, now, now I'm, I have a piece about it because the only thing that I want to identify with and it's the only thing that Jesus is about is, is, is a people who submit to his reign Right? who genuinely submit to him as Lord and have his spirit flowing in their life and therefore his DNA flowing in their life, therefore his character flowing in their life, so they're starting to manifest th their life. The tribe that Jesus came to birth, and it's the only tribe I'll defend, is, is the tribe of folks who are aspiring to, however imperfectly, aspiring to look like Jesus, love like Jesus, serve like Jesus, sacrifice like Jesus. Everything else is just state religion. Everything else is just some national cultural thing. It can do good, it can do bad, but it's, it's, it's not the kingdom of God. All religions do some good, all religions do some bad, all governments do some good, all governments do some bad. That's just what it is. I don't have to defend that or protect that or anything. No, no, the kingdom of God always looks like Jesus, always looks like Jesus. So don't blame Jesus for what other people do, regardless of what they call themselves, regardless of, of how they identify themselves. That's just that. No, 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 don't blame Jesus for what folks do. In fact, you read Revelations, you'll find Jesus, if you're mad at, at, at some of the things that the church has done, Jesus is probably madder. Because you read Revelations 2 and 3, he reams out the churches when they don't live up to the Lord that they profess. So point number one, Jesus didn't come to birth a religion. He came to found a movement. Number two, and I want to be careful with this. I've been so careful up to this point, but not, now I have to <laughs> really be careful. Okay, I'm not, I, I, I have no interest in scapegoating, trying to deflect blame, trying to make the church look better than it is. I want to just be raw and honest here. At the same time, it is the case that some of our negative perception of Christians or the church, both on the, on the part of Christians and those outside the church, some of it has, is tainted uh, because of media and some of the agenda that's out there. Look at, uh, media gives the megaphone to whoever they want to give the megaphone to. And they give the megaphone to whatever fits their agenda. And a large part of their agenda is to sell, okay? It's, they're selling stuff. Uh, if, it, if it bleeds, it leads. They're looking for a wow factor. Uh, and so they want to bore people with news. So, of course, it's the sensational, the odd, the shocking that gets on the news. And if you have people who have a, 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 their own agenda to try to make Christians look bad, well, that's just going to feed into it. And so you have it that, you know, here's this guy in Florida. So far as I can tell, and, and I, I would not even mention him except for the fact that now it's global news. But seeing him interviewed, I, I suspect the guy is, is simple. He's challenged in some ways. Uh, he's starving for attention. Uh, there's a lot of folks in leadership that are like that. And so he, decide, he finds he can get some good attention and feel righteous. He's got a church of like 25 people for crying out loud. No one would ever know about this guy. If it wasn't for CNN and, and other groups like that. And so he's going to burn the Quran. That's scandalous. So boom, now it's on the news. And then, it, then they, they hear about it over in Afghanistan. So they go and kill 14 people. And I don't know what's more demonic and stupid, burning the Quran or killing 14 random people because someone down here burned the Quran. None of it makes any sense. But the point we got to know is that there is a spin. There's always a spin on the media. And, and the reality is that there are... You'd never know this by watching the news, but there are hundreds and thousands of people, millions of people, who just love Jesus, who, who are humble like Jesus, who just want to live like Jesus and serve like Jesus and love like Jesus and, and care about the poor and do the work of Jesus, but they don't make the news because <laughs> they're boring. <laughs> hey, here's a good deed that was done. No, no, no. But you burn one Quran or, or, or mock one funeral, and then, and see, that just feeds it all, giving them attention. That's what they want. <sighs> Don't buy into the media distortion. There, there is, there's plenty of, of, of mean-spirited stupidity to go around in the church. Okay, We don't need to whitewash that. 
but it's made all the worse because of the media. Third thing, I want to encourage you, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't, throw the, don't fall into this trap of, of, of buying into generalizations. Uh, typically, here's how folks get offended and leave the church. Um, the pastor says something or does something, or doesn't do something, or somebody in the congregation says something, or does something, or doesn't do something, or maybe it's a group of people within the church, or maybe it's the whole church does something, or doesn't do something, or says something, and you're offended, and you're mad. And you finally come to a breaking point where you say, I'm done. I'm done with the church. I'm done with those Christians. I'm done with organized religion. Now ask yourself the question, who hurt you? Uh, Was it the church? Or was it a bunch of yahoos in the church? You see, what is the church? Who are those Christians? What is organized religion? It's kind of general, don't you think? Kind of an abstraction. And so what happens is we empower a particular pastor or a particular people or a particular church to speak on behalf of all the church or all the Christians or all organized religion. And then we throw the baby out with the bathwater. We declare war on the whole thing. And nothing good can happen of that. Uh, that is simply a prejudice. Folks, that's just prejudice. This is what a prejudice is. Where on the basis of, of how a particular, few particular people treat you, you draw a generalization. It's like people saying all Americans are jerks because the four Americans you met are jerks. Well, no, there's a few that maybe are nice. <laughs> or, or all Minnesotans are, are, are stoic because the few that you met are stoic, which is probably a little more true, but still, you get my point. <laughs> you, you know, you, you can't draw these kind of generalizations. Or because, you know, I, I, I live some, next to some black neighbors and they were so mean to me uh, I, I, that I, I don't, I'm never going to hang out with black people again. Or the white people I met were abusive and arrogant, therefore I'm never going to hang out with white people again. Or maybe it's the Asians or maybe the Hmong or, or whoever. We, we develop a prejudice where you empower a few people to speak on behalf of the whole. And nothing good can come of that. In fact, I believe the forces of evil are always at work when we embrace prejudice. Whether it's about a church or a country or a race You see, here's the thing. It's an ultimate trap, a diabolical trap, a demonic trap. Because it's very hard to ever get freed of that. When you embrace a prejudice, a generalization, and now it jaundices, it colors the way you look at the world. And now you look for things that will confirm your stereotype, your prejudice, and you delete out things that would count against it. So guess what? You're always finding confirmation of your prejudice. And it just just ingrains you in there. It's, It's hard to get free from because generalizations and abstractions don't do anything. They're not even real. Um, so you can't, you, you can't fight a generalization. You can't forgive a generalization. You can't be forgiven by a generalization. You're just stuck with this simmering pollutant in your head. Don't, don't throw that baby out with the bathwater. If you're mad, get clear on who you're mad at. It's those particular people. It's that particular pastor. Maybe it's that particular church. Be mad at them. But don't generalize it to everybody. And always remember that the purpose for being mad, if you're a follower of Jesus, the purpose for being mad is to get over it. (laughs) And and finally get to the point where you let people go. Maybe you'll never trust them again. Fine. But to let them go, that's what forgiveness is all about. But don't buy into this generalization. That's just Stuckville. And finally, and then we'll turn to some questions here. Number four, don't let the hurt take you out of the game. I want to be, I, I so empathetic, I'm so empathetic to folks who have been hurt and have scars and have been dumped on by Christians or the church or religion or what have you. I've actually had my fair share of that. I, I understand uh, the difficulty of that. It's been flushed my way more than once, uh, and you got to deal with that. But don't, and here too, I think forces of evil can be at work. Don't allow that to take you out of the game, and by that I mean... Don't allow that to isolate you. So typically the way it happens is the pastor says something or doesn't do something or does something bad and or some people in the church do something bad or whatever. So you get mad and you reject the church or you reject organized religion. You reject those Christians. And if you're still a believer in Jesus, what happens is you have your little me and Jesus club or me and my family in Jesus club. And and, and so you you maybe have once in a while your little worship time. with your family and uh, maybe a Bible devotion time with your family and uh, maybe you go out and do some good deeds once in a while with your family. That's really nice, isn't it? Because, you know, there's no risk in that. No one's going to hurt you there. 
Don't have to put up with all these butthead Christians in the church. You know, you got your little me and Jesus club. Um, you don't have to drive to church. It's right there whenever you want it. Don't have to take up an offering. No, no. But if you want to give money, just give it right to, to the Salvation Army or whatever. Don't have to support that whole big ministry thing going on there. It's really nice because uh, you get to have whatever music you like. You don't have to put up with music that's too loud or too soft or too fast. You can't find the stupid downbeat on the thing, you know. You know, you don't put up with that. No, no, no. You get to have it your way. And a sermon, you know, if the sermon gets a, a little boring, which ours, of course, never do. But if there was a sermon that got a little boring, well, then you, then you can just turn it off, you know. You do a little podcast thing. If you like it, you listen to it. If you don't, well, then you just move on to the next one. You can have it your way. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's just like cable news. We can have reality our own way. You get to choose your reality. So everyone's getting siloed in their little hate groups, you know, and they can't talk to the other groups. You know, you get your own spin. And all of those spin zones are calling themselves the no-spin zone. Well, now you get to have church with just your spin, just your liking, your cultural spicing on it, exactly the way you want it. How nice. But I submit to you, if you are a follower of Jesus and you believe in the New Testament at all, that is not an option for you. It's happening more and more all over the place. But I submit to you, it's, it's just not an option. Um, not a permanent option. I, you see, there are times that you'll go through where you go solo. Uh, you know, you're in between churches, that happens, or you move to an area where there are no churches or, or, or whatever. And I think if that's the case, God's calling you to start a church. But, but as, a permanent, as a permanent solution, it, 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 it's not an option. Because to be a Christian in the New Testament is to belong to the body, to be part of the body. It's like we saw earlier. What does it say? 1 Corinthians 12. Just as the body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. The analogy is saying that if, you, if, you are dis, if you're isolated from the body, you're dismembered. How long would my finger survive if I cut it off? Not long. So also, if we're cut off from the body, we, we, the, the flow of life isn't going to be coming into us. It is intrinsic to the kingdom. To believe in Jesus means you're part of the bride, which means that there's some kind of organic relationship with you and the bride. You come together to worship God together. You come together to, to teach and to learn and to grow together. You come together to serve one another. There's 57 one another's in the New Testament. You come together to evangelize. And, and, and to win the lost. I have yet to meet somebody doing, going solo who does that. The, the, the life and the vibrancy and the power of the kingdom is lost when we're disassociated from the rest of the bride of Christ. That's why belonging to the church, folks, is not a recommendation in the Bible. Like a nice, a nice little suggestion. It's a command. It really is a command. So the author in Hebrews says this. Look at this. Hebrews 10. Let us consider how we ought to spur one another on toward love and good works. Interesting thing is about spur. What a metaphor. It, they don't feel good, do they? <laughs> Here's a spur. But we're supposed to be spurring one another. Yeah, uh, On to good works. Encouraging one another. Stay in the game. That's part of the reason why we come together. And then it says, um, don't, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Even in the first century, there are people who are skipping church. <laughs> And they didn't have podcasts back then uh, or television evangelism. They're skipping church. Rather, we're to be encouraging one another. It's a non-negotiable command in Scripture to belong to Christ is to belong to his body. Uh, going solo is not an option. No, it doesn't have to be this big weekend event. In fact, we always have said here that this isn't the full expression of, of the church. This is an event where we worship and, 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 and we, we, we teach. But we don't do most of the one another's here. We can't do most of the one another's here. This isn't the full expression of church. In the New Testament, the main, the main unit, the main uh, uh, expression of the church was house churches, where people got together. And in each other's houses, usually groups of 10, 15, 20, 25 people, there they would worship together and study together and learn together and serve one another and serve the world and evangelize. But in the New Testament, you find both. Both are legitimate. They all have a role to play. Uh, they would meet in Solomon's court, Acts 5, 5,000 people getting together, and they'd also meet daily in each other's houses. There's room for both. The, 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 most of the growth comes, however, in the house church. And so we've always had that as a priority here, always trying to create opportunities for people to get connected. Now we're, we're really encouraging people to get online and, and look at what's called the table, just a way of meeting people to start hooking up, to share life with one another. What concerns me is that some folks today who get that the big church isn't the full expression of church, they sometimes give up on it. Oh, that's just mixed church. That's consumer church. That's attractional model church. That's just American church. They give up on it, but they don't have the house church uh, to replace it with. 
And I, how is that an improvement? How, and now you're just doing the Me and Jesus Club. That is not an option. We need to be sharing life together, serving one another, caring for one another. Uh, it's a non-negotiable option in the body of Christ. So, summarizing, then we'll turn to questions. Don't blame God for what people do. People do nasty stuff. God doesn't. Guard against this media distortion. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Guard yourself against the temptation to embrace generalizations that just prejudice you against the church, against Christians, or against anybody. And finally, get connected. Stay connected. Stay involved in the body of Christ. You've got an important role to play there. Okay, questions. How do you think the twisted behavior of some church leaders gets started, like the Westboro Church? They seem to believe strongly in their convictions. They do certainly believe strongly in their convictions. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if there's one... I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, I, I imagine that there's a hundred different reasons why things like this get started. Um, from what I know about groups like this, you're talking about some seriously demented, sick folks. And the thing about, usually in these groups, there's a very, very strong leader um, who is sick and demented, and unfortunately also charismatic and strong and has authority over people. And then you get people who often are very idealistic and discouraged by kind of the status quo, so they're going to believe promises that are made by, by these folks. Uh, or you get people who are also very wounded and therefore vulnerable to folks like this, and one thing leads to another. Uh, this is how you, you know, have the Jonestown thing going on. Uh, you know, the, the, the bottom line is this, that there, there, this is something that we just got to be aware of. But there's a certain kind of personality profile which needs attention and affirmation and, and, and needs to feel important. And see, if you're not getting your life from Christ, we all need that. We, we, we need to, you're going to be trying to get it from other people. And if you're in the right social context, there is no better way to feel important and feel like you're really something than becoming a pastor, where people are going to see you in traditional frameworks as being closer to God, and you speak with the voice of God. And in some cultures, in some contexts, it almost borders on worship. And a pastor gets all these benefits, these privileges and whatever. And see, if you go in, in, into the ministry, I think that's why the number one thing, the number one requirement of anybody who's going to be a leader is you've got to have a life. And the life has to come from Jesus Christ. Because if you're not getting your life from Jesus Christ, you're going to start getting it from the sheep. And now instead of feeding the sheep, you're going to be feeding off of the sheep. And that already is a sick system. Now, it doesn't go to the Westboro you know, degree, but there's a lot of churches that are, are to some degree dysfunctional because now the job of the sheep is to carry out the will of the pastor, and the will of the pastor always involves some kind of a, look at how wonderful I am. And that's a very, very uh, sick uh, sort of a, a situation. Uh, however God leads you in, in finding a body to line up with, and here I'm talking to folks in the congregation and folks who podcast, uh, make sure that you're following somebody who's healthy, <laughs> Healthy. They, they, they're, not, they're not using you and the church as a way of uh, idolatrous way of trying to give themselves worth and significance. Uh, excellent question, Brad. Thanks. Another one. If the church is to welcome everyone to follow Jesus, then what authority does the Catholic Church have to excommunicate anyone? Hmm. Interesting. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, Jesus had, uh, here's his balance. On the one hand, when Jesus walked around the hillside of Galilee and taught, he didn't, he didn't at all worry about who was following or who wasn't following, followed him. Whoever followed him, followed him. And no one was pleasing the crowd, and he was just happy the people were there. He taught. Sometimes it was really affirming teaching. Sometimes it was hard teaching. Sometimes the crowds grew. Sometimes the crowds left. Whenever there was needs, they just met it. No one did theological background checks. So there's this all-inclusiveness uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, Jesus in Matthew 18 talks about uh, uh, the church as a more intimate setting. And there he says that here's how you handle disputes and debates and offenses uh, that come up. And you go to the person alone. If that doesn't work, you go with two or three others. If that doesn't work, you bring them before the whole church. Now, when they're thinking about church here, they're not thinking about a body like this where there's a, a thousand people in a room. Uh, they're thinking of a house church where there's maybe 15, 20 people who are sharing life together. And there, as a last-ditch effort, if there's somebody who is uh, just living in, in, in offensive, rebellious, unrepentant sin, there can come a time where you say, we have to now consider you a non-believer because you're choosing to live this way. 
And, and there's an excommunication that goes on there. It doesn't mean they don't love them or talk to them anymore. Jesus says, let them be as a pagan. Of course, you love the pagans. You just, he's trying to keep clear the difference between being a pagan and being a follower of Jesus. So if you're going to live this way, well, then you, we, we, you have to be, uh, we have to see you as a pagan. So there's, there's that kind of excommunication. The Catholic Church just has a way of doing that as an official institution. And you can disagree. In fact, I do disagree with some of the theology behind that. But I can't, I can't throw out the whole idea of excommunication altogether because that is a biblical idea. Uh, in, in Anabaptist circles, it was called the ban, where you just decide a person is no longer going to be considered a brother or sister in Christ. It doesn't mean you at all judge them or are hostile towards them. It's just a way of saying, I mean, if you're in a small group, for example, and somebody's cheating on their wife and they're not going to repent of it, you've got to do something. To act like everything's okay is to condone it. That's what we're talking about. And there's, there's a point where you've got to confront yeah. and, and say, look, yeah. this is not by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, there's some gray areas. This isn't one of them. <laughs> and this is the thing we've got to act on. Um, and, and you have to turn from that. It would be unloving not to do that. Okay, got time for one more. Uh, Michaela, if someone doesn't identify as a follower of Christ because of the church, but lives a life like Christ, are they part of the kingdom? Will they still go to heaven? Thanks for the question. Uh, here, here's, here's the thing. is I don't believe that human beings are ever in a position to say in a definitive way that somebody is or is not going to heaven. I, I don't find... Only God can make that judgment. Uh, we, 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 we don't know... The only time that anyone in the New Testament ever claims to know someone else is lost is Jesus, and, he, and that is with regard to the rich man, and, the, and it's in the middle of a parable, and you should never be pressing parables for literal details. And so you leave all judgment to God, all judgment to God. Paul, Paul says this uh, in 1 Corinthians 4, I believe, I believe it is, maybe it's 1 Corinthians 5. Yeah, I think it's 5. He says, uh, uh, what concern do I have judging those outside the church? I have no business doing that. He says, but those inside the church, and now he's talking about a guy, who, uh, a leader in the Corinthian church who's sleeping with his stepmother. Ooh. And the Corinthians are not doing anything about it. He's saying, that's who you got to judge. There's a, there's a discernment that has to take place here. Now, even there, it's really interesting. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says you got to turn him out over to Satan. If that's the way he wants to live, you say that's the way you're going to live. But you can't consider that acceptable in the body of Christ. But even there, Paul says, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that a soul might be saved. Now, we could do a lot of you know, investigation about what does that mean, uh, but what, what's really clear is that Paul's goal is salvation. This isn't like, you're going to go to hell. It's like, oh, we want you to be saved, and therefore we've got to expose this. So it's always done out of love uh, and for the, the purpose of saving others. So, uh, so in the end, I, 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 I'm just, what I know for sure is that I can say that when a person is... When there's a person who's living like Jesus, looking like Jesus, serving like Jesus, to that degree, God is present. Now, I don't know about the relationship with Jesus. Sometimes people have a more relationship with God. They don't have it in their head so much as they have it in their heart. Yeah. Um, but but, 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 uh, but I, I want to affirm that. On the other hand, you can have people who are, identify themselves as Christians, but if the kingdom doesn't, isn't present there, then I don't want to say the kingdom's present there just because of, 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 of how they name it. It's interesting, but in the Old Testament... You have this bizarre story of this rock. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 10. This rock that followed the Israelites. And, and out of it came this living water. That's kind of an allegory that is drawing there. But what's interesting is that they didn't know that that rock was Christ. Later on, they knew the rock was Christ. They were just happy that they had a rock. And, and uh, uh, um, I, I think a lot of people have a rock that, that, and they're, they have a kind of relationship with Christ, they just don't know it. And so they're learning how to, God's always drawing them. Acts 17 says, God at all times and all places is drawing people, trying to get them to grope for him and possibly find him, though he's not far from anybody. For in him we live and move and have our being. God is everywhere. In his love, he's everywhere. He's, he's drawing people everywhere. And so far as it's possible, given their cultural conditions, drawing them into the kingdom as much as possible. And if possible, then introducing them explicitly to uh, the, the one who gave his life for them and who died for them. Do you think a total separation between church and government is a good way to preserve the image of religion? First, I'm not at all interested in preserving the image of religion. I, I really could care less about religion. I, I, I think religion is the problem. It's not a solution. And we could go on, what, what, what do you mean by religion? But I'm not interested in preserving the image of religion. I am interested in preserving the integrity of the kingdom of God. And really, it's all I'm interested in. 
I, I'm interested in, in, in keeping the kingdom unique and separate and holy. And for that, I am a firm, firm, firm believer in the separation of government and the kingdom of God. But it's not like in some kind of policy way. I'm interested in the separation because, in fact, they've got nothing in common. They're, they're two totally different animals. The kingdom of God is, at its core, based on uh, believing in Jesus, submitting to Jesus, having the life of Jesus pour in you, and then living like Jesus. So it, it's all about serving and coming under others and, 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 and ascribing to others worth at cost to yourself and all of that. That has nothing in common with the governmental issues about how to lord over people, how to have authority over people, who gets to have who say, how do you solve issues that divide the polis? That, that, that's by definition what a political issue is. How do you take a, a group here in America or any other place you're asking the question, and how do we get along when you have all this plurality and all that kind of stuff? That's political stuff, and it can be important stuff, and fine, let's think about it. But don't think that this over here, this unique thing that we're called to manifest, the reign of God, the kingdom of God, that this is in any way related to that, uh, it, it's, you're comparing bicycles and aardvarks. It, it's, it's, it's two very different things. So I'm not like, trying to, as a policy, keep them separate. I'm just, I just want to say they are separated. And it's all the more important to do that here in America, I believe, because they've been so fused right from the get-go. I mean, from the first time Europeans came over here and, 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 and took everything, uh, it's been fused. They took everything by, by way of manifest destiny. It was, you know, in the name of Jehovah, we're going to conquer and kill. It's like, you know, Joshua and the Canaanites and all that kind of stuff. So from the start, we had this fusion uh, going on here. And uh, I think the founding fathers were brilliant in saying, that's scary. <laughs> we got to be careful about that. We just ran away from a monarchy. We don't want another one. We, don't, we ran away from a theocracy. We don't want another one. So I, I think the Constitution is a brilliant political document. But my interest is not in preserving the Constitution for some cause or whatever. I'm interested in just keeping the kingdom of God separate from all of that. Because history will show you, even if the Bible isn't adequate to show you, though that should be enough in and of itself, but history shows you that whenever the kingdom of God starts going to bed with the political system, it gets compromised. It gets used. It gets co-opted. Keep it a sink. Good question. I appreciate the question. Another one from Steve. Why doesn't the church do a better job of addressing this topic on a more regular and practical basis? Fair enough. Um, I, I, I think the problem is... When you say the church, now that's an abstraction. Uh, so I, I would have to, just, I guess, apply it to kind of the general church in America. Uh, why, why, doesn't, why don't we say more about this? Um, and the answer to that, I think, would be this. Two, two things. One is, if you're part of that system and you benefit from the system, it's very hard, it's very hard to you know, critique it. You're in it. Uh, and you benefit from it. It's, it's, it's a little bit like any system that you benefit from is going to be hard, a hard system to wake up to. That, that's why, for example, it's, it's hard. And I don't mean this against white folks. I am one. But it's, it's hard for white folks to wake up to the ways that we are privileged because we're so used to it and we benefit from it. And when you begin to notice that you know, the system kind of bends in our favor, well, that, might, that, that, that can make you uncomfortable. And it does make you uncomfortable, and you've got to make some tough decisions. Um, so it's kind of like there's a, there's, a, there's a subliminal reason why you maybe don't want to notice that. The same thing is true in a, in a church system. If, if I am part of a system that I identify as sort of, we're the righteous club, we're the religious club, we're the club that's got all the truth, we're the religion, you know, the, we're the insiders and they're the outsiders, and you've got clearly delineated lines there. And I benefit by being on the inside of that system. Well, then it's going to be hard for me to even notice how arbitrary the system is. That's why very few people notice how Christians tend to wink at sins that the Bible emphasizes a lot on. And we tend to really crack down on sins that are hardly ever mentioned. But they happen to be sins that we don't have. It's totally arbitrary. But you don't notice it because you benefit from it. You get to feel righteous. It's all, you always feel good when you can hammer on someone else's sin. Even though Jesus tells us to do the exact opposite. So one of the reasons, I think, is that um, uh, it's, it's, you know, the folks who are in power, it's to their advantage uh, not to go bashing the church, but to rather defend it and, and, and say, well, it's not that bad. It was not perfect, but it's not that bad. The other thing I'd say, however, is this. Um, this is changing. Like with this book on Christian, there's a lot of honesty that's coming up right now, and it's really refreshing. Uh, there is a whole movement, uh, not just in America, but, but around the globe, of folks that are... It's called by different names, uh, the, the sort of post-evangelical Christianity or post-Christendom Christianity. But there's just a lot of honesty going on about some of the junk that's been going down and, and the harm that's being done to the kingdom of God because Jesus is being associated with all sorts of 
human crap. And, uh, and, and so there's a lot of stuff changing now. It's uh, kind of an exciting time, certainly a turbulent time, but um, glad I'm a part of it. Got time for one more, sort of, a real quick one. Do you think that sins of leaders in the church are treated more harshly by God? Yes. <laughs> no, uh, you know what? Uh, it, this is a, 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 a biblical teaching in the New Testament. That the, the God holds those who are leaders to, uh, to a higher degree of accountability. And the Bible teaches that exp- uh, explicitly in James. Uh, you know, be careful about aspiring to be a teacher, it says. Uh, because you're responsible. And God holds you more responsible. That's why the, the, in, in the New Testament, the requirements, I mean, it, there's, there's, no, there's no like set parameters about who is in and who is out. If, if you want to follow Jesus, you just join. And, and you just kind of go along. You're going in this direction. So that no one's policing all these parameters. Um, on the other hand, when it comes to leadership positions, you find in the New Testament some very strict requirements. Some of those are culturally conditioned based on sort of the particulars of the culture. But all of them are saying you teach, you lead, not just by what you say, not even primarily by what you say, but by your life. So if you're going to model it, you've got you've to be living it. And um, uh, when leaders fall, and this is just that principle of proportionality we talked about a couple weeks ago, when leaders fall... More people are harmed. And so the ante is upped. Um, and so the, the, the more you're in a position where you have the power to influence folks for the kingdom of God, the more you're in a position where if you screw it up, you're going to be harming a lot of people. And so God, God does, I think, uh, have a higher uh, level of accountability for those who are in leadership uh, than others. And it's treated more harshly. That's why the, the, the New Testament teaches, though this is rarely done, that when leaders fall in significant ways anymore, anyways, you can't hide it. You have to go public with it. Now, it doesn't mean you air it to everybody, but all who are affected, who are under the leadership of a person, when they fall in certain ways, you've got to come out with that. And so the Bible says, don't hide, expose the sin of leaders openly. Um, nothing but corruption happens when we try to cover that over, usually in the name of what was going on with that first question or the second question, uh, keeping a good image. Ah, the church, the holy folks. You know, when it doesn't happen, you got to like brush it under the rug and relocate them or something like that. When you are attending a church where crap is happening to you or others, how do you decide whether to stay at that church or leave? If it's this church, stay. Otherwise, leave. <laughs> that, no, that, that actually is a very, very good question. In the end, here's how I encourage people to think about it. You got to ask the question, is God calling you to change this body, the body that you're involved in, uh, or, or is he calling you to leave? If he's calling you to stay, and now follow this, if he's calling you to stay, then he is calling you to be an agent of change. So you got to ask the question, are you in, do you have any uh, authority, any position, any influence to change? If you're in a religious system where all the power is located in one or two or three people up front and no one has the, there's nothing you can do about it, then it's very unlikely that God's calling you just to stay there uh, if this crap is significant kinds of crap. I mean, there's going to be ordinary crap that you've got to put up with just because there's people involved, but I'm talking about significant uh, kinds of crap. You ask, are you called to change? And if not, I submit you should seriously think about leaving because the worst thing is to stay in a religious system that you do nothing but complain about. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I had a, a person here oh, eight, nine years ago who was saying, well, I don't agree with some of the leadership's doing, so, uh, so I, I'm going to withhold my tithe. I'm not going you know, to con- contribute any more money because I'm mad. And my encouragement to them was, was this. Like, if you don't trust the leadership enough to contribute to the ministry, I really encourage you to go out and find another ministry that you can trust because it's not good for you or us for you to be sitting in a system where you're under untrusted le- leadership. You know, that will do, whatever God can do here, you're going to be hindering it. Uh, so find a church you can trust. And you'll never find one that's completely crap-free and that you, can, you, know, that you agree with on everything, uh, but at least one that you agree with the core vision and, and you trust the character of the leaders and things like that. But in the, end, uh, in the end, it's something you just got to go to God on and ask God, and hopefully you have others in your life that you share life with. Get wisdom from them and say, what, what, what do you think should be done? Or should we stay and try to change or should we leave? And if you stay and try to change, remember 1 Corinthians 16, 14, that everything you do be done in love. You have to do it in a loving way. If you can't do it in a loving way, don't do it. Coming in with arrogance or self-righteousness or divisiveness or the phone call ministry where you gossip about people in Jesus' name, 
That's not of God. Uh, better to leave and go somewhere else than to try to change that way. Change it in a loving way if you're going to change it at all. Okay, another question. Andrew, no church is perfect. No! Okay, that's a tautology, a truism, a redundancy. No church is perfect, and most believe they're doing all right, ours included. Yeah. How could we improve? You're killing me! What about people who have left here because of things that have happened? You know, how could we improve? Here's one, I, I guess, I'll put one virtuous thing forward, uh, one positive thing forward here. And that is that uh, the leadership of Wilderness Church, I, I, I will, will be the first to tell you that we're not perfect and the first to ask, how can we improve? Um, it's, you know, there, there's an openness to change there, an awareness that... that um, um, of our fallibility, and, and uh, so I, 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 for all the other things that are not hitting on all pistons here, and there's a lot of things that don't hit on all pistons, I think there's a character at, that, that, that extends all the way up uh, into the top leadership of, of humility and an openness to say, how can we improve? Um, what about folks who have left? You know, um, I, I, I would love it if we would have uh, some kind of exit interview to find out kind of all that's going on there. I, I, I always want to learn that. I mean, sometimes people are just called to other places, and I bless that. We've never thought all right, it was our job to build a big church ever. No, it's about contributing to the kingdom, however that looks. So we don't want to ever hang on to people to hang on to people. But sometimes people leave for, for reasons that are, that are, are not because God called them. It's because of stupid stuff we do or of our perceptions or of ministry something or other. And I would love to learn from that. Um, uh, and, and so sometimes folks write, write uh, someone in, in the leadership to share why they left. Uh, most of the time they don't, and so we're left kind of guessing. But we're always asking the question, how can we grow? How can we learn? Our, our top issue has been how do we help people get connected? I feel like we've never really been that good at that. Um, this table that we have online now is one of the things that, that we're trying to help people uh, at their own pace in their own way, just kind of get connected and jump in. We've always had these small groups but it's very hard for a person to just jump into a small group where you, these 10 people who have known each other for three years and you're the new person, that's kind of intimidating. Uh, if you're an extrovert, maybe you're up to it, but most people are not. So, so we haven't created a, a real good mechanism for people to get connected. We're, we're trying uh, and, and, and open to uh, su suggestions. All right, I've got time for one more, I believe. A quick one. How can we explain to people that Christianity itself is not the bad guy without resorting to saying... Well, those Christians are doing it wrong. Well, those Christians are doing it wrong. Okay, look at, here's a piece I was, I don't think I said this in the message. I said it in the first service. I didn't say it in the second one, but I think it's, it's good. Um, I have found that one of the best ways to evangelize these days is to side with non-Christians against the church in favor of Jesus. Um, it's gotten so bad, I honestly, uh, I, I usually, unless I know what a person means by the terms, I don't identify myself as Christian or as evangelical. Uh, I don't get to ter decide what terms mean, and the terms out there, just read that book on Christian, the terms out there represent to a large degree stuff that I am not for at all. Um, so if people ask me, I, I usually say that I'm a follower of Jesus. I, I, I follow Jesus. Um, and I know I've had a number of conversations with folks that I wouldn't have had if I would have answered yes when they asked me, are you a Christian? They see me reading a book on theology, oh, are you a Christian? And I always respond by saying, well, I, I aspire to follow Jesus, but I'm not really comfortable with that term. And then we have a conversation, and it turns out in the course of the conversation that they got dumped on royally uh, by some Christian or other, and if I had said yes to being a Christian, we probably wouldn't have had this conversation. If the, if the gripe is legitimate, and often they are, I don't try to defend the church at all, or Christianity. What's Christianity? It's, it's a religion. I don't try to defend that. I rather side with folks in their complaint, their observation about the church or Christians or Christianity in history. And I do that to then show that Jesus is not at all like that. Yeah. The conversation is always like, but have you noticed Jesus isn't at all like that? That's what's peculiar. <laughs> Jesus never killed anybody. He never tortured anybody. In fact, he told people not to kill. How ironic that is. And so I, as a follower of Jesus, if the, if, if the claim is, is all legitimate, I'll side with the people in order to show that Jesus was not at all like that. It's ironic and sad that what was meant to be the greatest proof of Christianity is now the obstacle you got to get out of the way to get people into the truth of Jesus Christ. But to a large degree, that's just the way it is. And so I encourage you to, 
Uh, be an advocate for one thing and one thing only, and that's Jesus Christ. You know, don't sell a religion. Don't, don't go selling your set of doctrines. Don't sell anything. No, no, just, just manifest Jesus Christ in your life and in your words uh, and how you serve people and how you love people. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater when you get hurt. Don't blame Jesus for what others have done. Don't fall into the trap of prejudice and stay connected to the body of Christ. That's where the life is found and manifested. I'll close in prayer, and I'd like to ask the prayer teams to come up. And if you have any need whatsoever that you'd like to have prayed for, I encourage you to uh, take advantage of this time and come up and get prayed for. Jesus, we thank you for calling us to be your body. We confess that we're sinners and don't do that. Haven't done it very well. Father, help us to just be aware of the two by four in our own eye and not go looking for specks in other people's eyes. Father, help us to, to just humbly serve and love the way you hu humbly have loved and served us on Calvary. And Lord God, weave us together as a people. Heal all the scars, the wounds that are there. Both of those listening through the podcast, those who are in, in this auditorium, Father, be a healing agent. Lord God, and, and help us to find our role, our niche, our function in the body of Christ, that your bride will be continuing the process of making herself ready, preparing for your return, holy and blameless in your sight, ravishing your heart as we put on display your character and your love to a world that desperately needs it. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you guys. Get connected. Go out and build the kingdom.